Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 5 of my KSP campaign. At the conclusion of our last episode, Valentina had just failed to achieve our first orbit around Kerbin of, the, of our campaign. And I decided at the end of the episode that I wasn't going to try this again until after I had upgraded my launch pad and was able to build a craft that could exceed that 18 ton limit. So uh, I thought the best thing to do would be to move on to something that was a little bit more dependable. Yes, we got another one of these tourist contracts to go to a suborbital trajectory. And this time it's Jebediah escorting, what is it, Glacella? Glacella. I don't think Glacella. We'll never see her again after this, so it doesn't really matter. But she is paying us some curve bucks to get her up into space. And this is going to be, once again, a suborbital trajectory. Our fifth suborbital trajectory. I'm just realizing that, though two of them were meant to become orbits. But anyway, this is our third intentional suborbital trajectory. And this is uh, the next iteration in the Kirkury series. This is Kirkury 3. On a couple episodes, you saw Kirkury 2 do much the same sort of mission, except this one has been improved in a number of different ways. I've got the bigger fuel cans. I've got the swivel engine on it. I've got the uh, nifty little escape tower up at the top, which, uh, well, quite frankly, really is there just for looks, but I do like the look of it, and uh, yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's semi-practical, I suppose, if something explodes. <laughs> and uh, But the most noticeable thing is that I ditched the two Mark I capsules at the top and instead went with the two Spud capsules uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I think it looks better. I kind of like this kind of bulbous look at the top of this thing. And number two, this thing does have some bigger windows. Um, but for the most part, this uh, this whole mission is a carbon copy of what you saw two episodes ago. So I'm not going to spend too much time with it. So we'll decouple our escape tower. Arm our parachutes. It's weird, I don't know why the, the parachutes don't arm through staging anymore. If I hit the stage button, I get this message that the parachutes aren't armed properly. Not sure what that is all about. And of course, we do that while pointing in a normal direction so that those two things will go off in a, distant, a direction that is perpendicular to our trajectory. Now, the one thing that is a little bit different about these, uh, these spud capsules compared to the Mark I capsule is the Mark I capsule is uh, naturally aerodynamic and will orient itself retrograde without you having to do anything and you're best to just turn the SAS off. This thing, no, not like that. <laughs> it, it, it is not aerodynamically stable, tends to tumble. If anything, it wants to point around the other way. So I'm going to keep the SAS on and, uh, and keep it on the retrograde vector manually. Uh, keeping an eye on my debris as we fall because I do want to recover this thing later. Parachutes should deploy on their own as we get further down. Okay, G forces are starting. To, where the heck did that come from? Look, I pushed you off in the other direction. That was close. <laughs> oh well. Uh, at least it didn't hit us. I don't know why that happened. Trixie aerodynamics and. Oh shoot. Oh, oh. Okay, I was concentrating on the thing, and now I've lost which, which, is that debris there, my first stage, or is that debris there, my escape tower? Not really sure. Okay, there's one, where's the other one? There it is down there. Falling, falling. Okay, I don't know which one of these is the one I want to keep track of. Oh, okay, well that one just crashed into the water without any chutes deploying. So let's follow this one. And it just crashed into the water without chutes deploying. I don't know why the chutes didn't deploy. Uh, okay, well, I'll have to sort of figure that out later. 
Yes, and subsequent investigations in, at the Kerbal Space Center revealed that, yeah, both sets of debris were destroyed and nothing was recovered other than these capsules. Uh, but uh, I'm going to have to put uh, figuring this out for another time because right now I think it's time to get on to the Otter 1, which is our jet plane, which is going to perform not one, not two, but three separate uh, visual surveys of Kerbin missions. Yeah, one of the things, um, I've been a little bit tight for money. <laughs> the last couple of missions, you might have noticed, mostly was because I spent almost all my money when I, uh, when I set in motion the upgrading of the launch pad. But part of the reason why I felt comfortable about doing that is because I did have all these ships already in the building queues, and I knew that this three-off mission was coming, which should generate me quite a bit of cash. Okay, so this is the first of these visual survey missions, so why don't we spend a little bit of time talking about it. So what you want to do is you want to go over to the map view by pressing M and select your first waypoint. So you click on it and then say activate navigation. And what that does is it sets an icon onto your nav ball that you can follow. You also want to look at what that was. That was this Mario Reckless thing, so I got to be below 18... Uh, 18,800 meters I need to be below. You do want to make sure that you, uh, you uh, are doing what you're supposed to be doing and I should be doing a crew report at that time. So we'll throttle up and we'll head on off with our little plane again. Uh, you see me test fl uh, fly this plane. I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. I did a, a few modifications to it but for the most part it's the same thing that you saw earlier except for this time uh, we're flying a mission for real. There's no reverts or anything that's going to be happening from here on in. So we're turning around and now you can start to see that uh, waypoint marker appearing on the nav ball. Um, now, 18, I'm not going to get anywhere near an altitude of 18 kilometers. So when it says below, I hope they don't mind if it's well below because that's what it's going to be. And I know when I uh, designed this thing, I spent quite a bit of time talking about uh, plane design and balance between lift and center of lift and center of mass. But while this thing is climbing, why don't we talk a little bit about control surfaces and uh, you know uh, how you want to tweak them. Remember, with the control surfaces, you're able to control which surfaces control yaw, pitch, and roll. Okay, so let's start with that big vertical fin that is sticking up at the back, that tail fin. Uh, that guy I have set just to control yaw. Yaw is left and right motion. Remember, whatever direction the control surface is going, it's controlling direction that is perpendicular to it. So that tail fin can't do anything when it comes to trying to control pitch, and it can't do anything when trying to control roll, because both of those two um, directions are not perpendicular to the direction that tail fin is going. So it can only control yaw, so you set it so that that's the only thing it can control. The airlines on the um, wings, however, can control both pitch and roll. Now, when I get into bigger planes, I actually make those things just for roll. The wings are really good for roll, right? And a way to sort of picture why the wings, why the control surfaces on the wings are good for roll, is imagine your plane hanging by a string, like it's a model of your plane, hanging by a string uh, by the center that's attached to the center of mass of your plane, and your plane will be balanced on that on the center of mass. And if you wanted to roll the plane either left or right, where would you apply a force with your finger in order to affect that change in attitude. Well, you would the, the most efficient place for you to push with your finger would be at the wingtips, right? Because they're further out, you're going to get a lot of torque when you go ahead and do that. So that's why the wings are a good place to put uh, roll control surfaces. For pitch, you want to have your control surfaces that control pitch, either towards the front, in which case we call them canards, or towards the back, in which case we call them elevators. Okay. This plane has neither of those. Now, one of the reasons was it was so small, and the um, control surfaces are all like the wings and the tail. They're all so big compared to the plane. I didn't want to stick on anything more. Maybe when I get some smaller control surfaces, I might give it a go. But if you take a good look at it, those uh, control surfaces on the wings are actually 
quite a ways back because of that swept wing design. So they're doing a good job of uh, controlling pitch on their own. This thing has absolutely no trouble with pitch control. And there's our message indicating that we're where we want to be. So we take our crew report over the highlands and we, we save that. Notice the contract requirement goes green in the contract plus window. So we'll, we'll get rid of this. There we go. And now it's time to go and select our next waypoint. I think I'll go this guy over here. So zone 2 RR5 V Alpha. Activate navigation. And then we look over our contracts and we see that, oh, I got to get down on the surface. In fact, there's an alpha and a beta and I got to do an EVA report there. So let's see, I got to turn a little bit towards the right. And again, I should be seeing that uh, waypoint indicator come up on the nav ball. Yep, there it is. You might be noticing as well that I, uh, although I'm getting, I have some science that is available. I got an EV report, an EVA report, and a materials bay. Uh, you might be wondering why I'm not doing it. Well, the EVA report is flying over the highlands. I'm not going to EVA right now. That would be uh, rather suicidal. Um, and the materials bay study, I only have one materials bay, and Valentina's not a scientist, so she can't reset it. So I'm saving it for when I'm on the ground somewhere else. I can do these uh, low altitude material based studies anytime I want but uh, wherever it is that uh, what R2 RR5 V is uh, that might be in a biome that I might not visit again for a little while and while we're cruising over to our uh, next waypoint while we talk another thing about planes is if you're taking your plane a long distance you do want to find out what its ideal cruising altitude is you know if you're too low then the air is thicker and it's harder to get up to a very high speed if you get too high then the thin air does not produce adequate thrust to get up to a high speed so you want to play around and try and find a sort of sweet spot for your plane and, and I'm finding this you know in around 11 and a half kilometers for me for this plane seems to be working pretty good I'm over 250 well over 250 meters per second for my cruising speed and so I'm gonna tend to stick it around stick around this altitude as we make our way over to our waypoint and as we close in on our destination we want to cut back on our throttle and start to pitch down and uh, start to lose our altitude as we uh, close in on where it is that we want to land and definitely as you get closer and closer you want to swoop in pretty low and do a pretty uh, good survey of your landing area um, you don't be too obsessed about landing right at where the waypoint is um, you know obviously you want to be relatively nearby but it's much more important to find a, a relatively flat level piece of ground to put your plane down on than it is to land right on the money and then you can always just sort of drive your plane over to where it is that you need it to be and here we are coming in on our final approach remember you want to cruise along at a speed that's just a little bit over your stall speed which you can figure out by seeing what speed it is that it need you need to to in order to get off of the runway and there we go touchdown I do love this little plane it can drop in at such a low speed uh, it really is useful for uh, this type of a mission. So anyway, we're going to need to now drive our way over to uh, where our waypoint is, uh, the 2RR5V Alpha. I don't know why I enjoy saying that so much. And then once we are there, we'll do what science we can, including opening up this materials bay. And uh, Valentina also is going to need to do an EVA report on the surface. Now, one of the things about this plane is we don't have ladders. Yeah, we have jet engines, but we don't have ladders. <laughs> That's uh, something that the Kerbals have yet to invent. So we actually can't get ourselves down on the surface and then get back into the plane again. But no matter. If you stand on top of your vessel, that counts as being on the surface. So simply get up on top of your vessel, do your AVA, that counts as being on the surface. So with that done, we'll press map again, go to map view, select our next waypoint, which looks a little far away for, for me. So I think what I'll do is instead of trying to drive there, which I think will take a little while, I'm going to... Uh, do a little little fly, little fly hop. 
<laughs> little get in the air and get myself back down. So, oops, we're drifting backwards, so we'll throttle up a little bit, turn around. And uh, again, I want to look for a fairly flat piece of ground, or ground before I end up uh, throttling up completely. And I'll point it in the right direction, straight at the waypoint, and throttle up. And here we go. We go up. And let's see, looking over at the, whoa, I'm drifting down. Whoa, get up, get up, get up, get up. Whoa, that almost went really, really badly. Okay, let's see what's going on. This plane feels really goofy. I don't know what's going on. I'm having trouble. It's, everything's all, di oh, okay, I'm entering into the uh, beta zone already, and I'm leaving it already. Okay, I need to, why am I having trouble turning this thing around? Like everything, it doesn't feel. Oh wait, wait. Oh shoot. <laughs> I don't. I, uh, I think SAS is off. It certainly is off. Okay, let's try putting the SAS on and see what that. Oh, that feels a little better. Okay. <laughs> All right. So when you leave the vessel, the SAS turns off. I'll have to remember that for next time. Okay. Uh. Anyway, we'll just put this thing back down, and you know, it's just rinse and repeat. And with that done, it's time to check out our next waypoint. Here it is, Fernelia's Legend, I guess. Okay, so we'll set that and we'll take a look over at our contracts. It says, do a crew report at a flight above 19,400 meters. I don't think I can get this thing down. I didn't notice that. Above? I thought, okay. I can't get this thing above 19,400 meters. I'm, I'm, I'm almost sure of it. Oh, and yeah, and in the end, yeah, I was right. I can't get it above that altitude. Try as I might, there was no way to do it. So I'm going to have to leave this part of this contract for a better jet. <laughs> I have to unlock some better parts and see if I can not get a jet that can get up to a higher altitude. So then it was just making our way over to our last survey point this was just a crew report below 17,000 meters at zone 4 PZ9 and uh, that was easy enough to accomplish and then it was time to get us back to the Kerbal Space Center now by this point my fuel reserves are getting a little bit low you might be noticing there on the left that I only got about a third of my fuel left now I had been doing quite a lot of zigging and zagging going to different waypoints and now I'm gonna be going back in a more or less a straight line but still I thought it would be prudent to try and save fuel a little bit so I cut my throttle in half which required lowering my altitude you can see here I'm only at about nine and a half kilometers but if you take a look at my speed my speed's still in around 230 meters per second so although I am using you know I have my throttle at half I'm still uh, traveling at a reasonable velocity and I still got back with well Oh, plenty might be a strong word, but certainly a comfortable amount of fuel left and put it back down onto the runway. Uh, again, this thing is very easy to land, so uh, no issues whatsoever. And back at KSC, the completion of, well, two and two-thirds contracts, really, has improved my cash and science flow a reasonable degree. And uh, that allowed me to get into the Research and Development Center and unlock the flight control, or at least start the research on flight control. And this will get me those small reaction wheels, some smaller control surfaces that I really do want to have. But what I'm most excited about is this two-man radish capsule from Homegrown Rockets. I'm really excited about getting uh, that into the air and seeing what that is like. Now this unlocked a further build point that I was able to put towards Kerbal construction time and get something happening quicker. And while I am an odd about where I'm going to put this build point, I want to draw attention to the fact that my launch pad is now less than four hours away from upgrading and finally removing that 18 ton limit that I've had on my rockets. And that should allow me to push my Kerbals further and faster than what I've been able to do so far. Anyway, where I decided to put that extra point was in the rate two on the VAB. This will allow me to actually have multiple builds going at the same time, and uh, this should allow me to pump out vessels just a little bit quicker. But all of this is going to have to be for a future episode. 
Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.